The Kali, which means the age of darkness, in the cycle of the solar system, not in the cycle of the planet, in the cycle of the solar system, it does a cycle in twenty-five thousand nine hundred and twenty years. In this, if you divide it into half, there are four yugas and four yugas, totally eight yugas. Only the Kali and the Sat are coming together, paired together, two Sat yugas, two Kali yugas. But the other two yugas, the Dwapar yuga and Treta yuga are separated by Kali and Sat yugas. Now this is… the yuga that we're talking about is significant because of the distance that we create between the solar system and the super sun around which it is going around. The further away that it goes, lesser the intelligence of the beings here. So Kali Yuga is a time when there is maximum distance. Because of this maximum distance, the human intellect is at its lowest. And then as it starts moving closer, human intelligence will begin to blossom. Actually, they go to the extent of saying, that they will… human ability to understand and use the electrical and magnetic forces in the human system will get better as it gets closer and get worse as it gets further away. Today you know your intelligence is essentially how your neurons crackle in the brain, yes? If you see uh, a kind of a simulated image of the brain, you will see it's crackling around. Can we put this image? Do we have the brain image, Blue Brain Project? So, you will see it's pulsating with crackling like electricity because how much electrical charge it can carry determines how well you can think, how clearly you can think. One thing that recently the physical scientists have come to, the yogic sciences have been saying this for a long time, the physical scientists have come to this, they are saying, looking at the physical laws that rule the solar system, they feel there is no room for further development of human brain. Why this is so is, if you increase the size of the neurons, it will become more capable, but it will take too much electricity. Right now as you sit here, twenty percent of the energy is being spent in your brain. Twenty percent of the calorie, calories are right now being burnt in your brain. Remaining eighty percent for such a big part of your body, twenty percent is spent only here in your brain because brain is a high power consuming part of your body. Suppose your brain became this big, you would need too much energy, you would need such a big stomach to accommodate that. I know some of you are trying, but it doesn't work that way <laughs> That's not the way it works <laughs> If you… if you create such a big brain, you will not be able to supply power to it. If you increase the number of neurons, then you could still do better with the same amount of power. But if you increase the number of neurons, then the way it is packed right now, the clarity of signals will go away. This is the case with many hyperactive children. The number of neurons in their brain is higher than normal. They are brilliant but scattered all over the place. They can't think straight. They're brilliant in spurts but nothing comes out of it because there is no clarity. So if you increase the size, it doesn't work. If you increase the number, it doesn't work. So they're saying according to the physical laws, it is not possible for human brain to evolve further, but we can learn to use it better. 
right now the way we're using it is a very mediocre way. See, that's an electric charge. So increasing the size of the brain or increasing the number of neurons are not possible, so they're coming to this conclusion that human intelligence cannot be enhanced, but it can be better used. Right now, the, the way we are using it is very mediocre. If more sophistication comes to the way you use it, you can increase your brain power, they're saying approximately three thousand times than the way it is right now. Three thousand times more intelligent than the way you are right now would be incredible, isn't it? Three times more would be fantastic <laughs> So we can learn to use it better, but we cannot evolve this brain further because the physical laws don't permit it. The yogic sciences have said this long time ago that human intelligence and human body cannot be developed further because we have reached… the physical laws have reached this limit because the way the earth rotates around the sun and the way the moon cycles around the earth, all these things we have reached, human body has reached that potential. It cannot go further. But at the same time, yogic sciences once again say, but your ability to use it can be enhanced by doing variety of things. One of the things that we spoke about just now is brahmacharya. That is, you can generate that kind of energy in the system that if you had ten brains, it could still power it. If you have twenty-five brains, it could still power it. You could sit here and power one thousand brains which are sitting around you by generating the necessary energy, by raising the kundalini, by bringing your energies to full force, you can power a thousand brains if you want. That much energy is there. So we said, there are sages who are referred to as people who had thousand hands, ten thousand hands. Why it is being said is, what ten thousand men could do, one man is doing. In many ways, modern technology just represents that, you know. But in a much more internalized way, a human being can be in such a way that his intelligence could cover for a thousand people or ten thousand people or a million people because there is another way of generating more efficient energy within the system. The scientists are looking at how body generates energy in its normal condition and they're saying, if you have a little bigger brain, you will won't be able to supply power to it, but there are other ways to generate. And you don't need a bigger brain, you don't need more neurons, you need more energy. If you had more energy, more refined energy, you would see… See, if you had to light this hall, there was a time you need Five thousand watt bulbs we were using. Today, you use a hundred watt halite, it's on. Now, this hall is going to get… One of our meditators is sending it from United States to us. He manufactures the very powerful LED lamps. These bulbs will… are twelve old, okay? Twelve old bulbs, they're going to light up the whole hall. This was unthinkable just five years ago, with twelve old bulbs you're going to light up such a big hall, we are going to do it. So with very little power, we are lighting up things because the way we use the power and the refinement of how it happens enhances our ability to use it. What goes for a LED lamp definitely goes for the human body and human brain. So that's what yoga is constantly exploring. So Kalki, is uh, to come to end the age. To end the age of darkness, he's supposed to come. See, the nature of time is such, nobody need to begin it, nobody need to end it, it goes on anyway. Nothing may happen to you in your life, 
But time will pass, isn't it? <laughs> There's one thing you can be guaranteed of. In case you get some boon and become immortal, you may even become immortal, but you can't stop time from passing on, isn't it? So nobody has to begin an age and end an age. It is just that they said Kalki will come on a white horse, winged. So if horse has wings, it's a no good horse. Horse should have good legs. No? Am I saying something wrong? <laughs> a horse should have four good legs, that's a good horse. A horse which has wings is a lousy horse. Yes or no? So obviously, they were talking about a white horse metaphorically, not as a horse horse. It is a metaphoric thing that brightness will arrive. When the age passes, the darkness will move out and brightness will arrive and it will destroy the darkness. If you… if the hall is dark right now, if I turn on a light, does it destroy the darkness? What is spoken metaphorically? What is expressed dialectically? Foolish scholars or exploiters along the way make it all into black and white facts, made up facts. It is a metaphorical expression. As the solar system moves, it moves into a dark face and as it moves out, light arises. It will… it will rain upon us. Even if you don't want to be, suddenly your brain will crackle and work better because you moved into a different age. As we were saying this yesterday, even today, even in a comic book, even in a child's mind, My intelligence worked means light, yes or no? Isn't it so? I got a bright idea, bright idea, not a dark idea, understand? Because intelligence, always human beings have associated with light. So the scripture said, once the solar system moves out of this, a brightness will arise. This is very beautifully expressed. In the different yugas, human beings use different dimensions of intelligence, different dimensions of communication. In the Satyuga, mind will be more important. Mind, not intellect, mind will be more important. Probably this is the only culture where we make a distinction between mind and intellect. Today, modern scientists have started doing it for the first time in the last decade or so. Otherwise, mind was just one thing. So, the mind will be the main thing of communication and living. That is, if I want to say something to you, I don't need a microphone, nor do I have to shout at you like this. If I th think about this, you get it. In Satyuga, people barely spoke because mind was the means of communication. Everything that had to be done was just done mentally. Because it was all done mentally, they say even conception happened mentally. They go to the extent of saying there was no physical conception, it happened mentally. Then when they moved, into the Treta Yuga, eyes became important. So you will see when life moved into Treta Yuga, the language of people who lived in Treta Yuga are talking always about one of the basic greetings in India was, I see you. I think the recently this Hollywood movie made this very popular, I see you, Avatar. The basic greeting in this country was, I see you. Okay, you see me, so what? 
No, that's not it. I see you means I see you through and through. So treta, people use their eyes powerfully. This is called as netra sparsha, that you can touch somebody with your eyes. When it moved further down, the breath became very important. We were already looking at this, probably today morning or yesterday, that wherever the life energies are very high, there you will see your sense of smell will become very, very strong and sensitive. You will see this in the forest. Your sense of smell is more important than your eyes, ears and your brain. You know, really. Means you can just know what's happening with the person, in the sense. Now, uh, a few months ago, a month ago, we had the fortune of having a guest in the ashram who was a king cobra. Now, he uses his ma, tongue, to taste you from a distance. He knows the chemistry of who you are. Well, myself and a few of the brahmacharis are handling this, he looks like a pet cobra, he was just playing with him. But he is not a pet, he is deadly. If he… he can move so quickly and if he bites you, you have just eight to ten minutes. So you have just eight to ten minutes, that's all it gives you. It's deadly, it has enough venom to kill an elephant. But we are at ease with it because we understand that if you don't create the wrong chemistry in your system, he is fine with you. Cobra is the only creature who is so sensitive to your chemistry. All carnivorous animals and almost all wild creatures are sensitive to your chemistry, but particularly a snake is super sensitive. You can go in the wild and just pick up a venomous snake like this, not by the head, catching like this, no, just like this. He will simply come if you are at total ease. If you show a little anxiety, if your chemistry shows little anxiety, little fear, that's it, he'll go for you. Because he instantly knows what is happening in your system. So, he's perceiving this in a certain way, the reason why the yogis are always keeping a cobra next to them and the Shiva has cobra next to him is in terms of the creatures that are available on this planet, a cobra has a maximum amount of etheric aura around him. That means he is fabulous perception. So for perception, this particular animal is helpful and his perception is something that all yogis bow down to because his perception is even better than most human beings ever can be because of the etheric aura that he creates around himself. So you will see in the story there are many tribes which call them Nagas, they have the necessary uh, sadhana going to generate a certain amount of etheric aura so that they can perceive what others cannot perceive. Because only what you perceive you know. The rest is all rubbish, yes? It may be said by me, it may be said by a god, it may be written in a scripture, but it is all rubbish unless you perceive it. These dimensions of perception, mental perception, visual perception by smell, and now when it comes to Kali, human beings become totally verbal, their mouth becomes the biggest thing. So you need to understand this, the solar system is going through the yugas like this. If you are in tune with it, you are also going with these yugas. If you are above it, you can stay wherever you want. If you are stuck in your own things, the planet may be in Satyuga, you may be in your Kali Yuga. So every individual is still free 
to either transcend the yuga or be trampled by the yuga or ride the yuga as it is. All the three possibilities are there. So Kali or the end of the Kali, Kalki is supposed to come down on a white horse with wings. Don't get yourself a horse with wings, get yourself a horse with legs. This is funny, isn't it? But it was metaphorically spoken because the light or the intelligence need not necessarily come from you, it is coming because of a heavenly possibility, because the solar system is moving out of that face. Your intelligence will come out bright and it's a gift from nature. It is dropping upon you, it is a celestial gift. Because it's a celestial gift and there are certain constellations which are seen as a flying horse, you know this? There are certain constellations which are seen as a flying horse. They said it will descend upon you and destroy your darkness. If you want to destroy darkness, nobody needs to fly on a horse and come down. If you just turn on a small light, darkness gets destroyed. Darkness is the most fragile thing. But even that people can't get rid of because they're employing wrong methods. Suppose we turn off the lights and it's dark and you decide, suppose this hall is dirty, if I tell you clean it up, all of you with great enthusiasm if you go, probably in fifteen minutes time you can have the hall cleaned up. Now the hall is dark, then I tell you get this damn darkness out. If all of you with gro go with great enthusiasm till you die, if you do, still it will not go, but if we turn on a light, it will go. That is the nature of darkness. That is why a light being on a flying horse came down and took away the darkness. Unless you have still allowed it to live within you. <laughs>